So the first theme that we're going to uh, start on is uh, what I have something I've titled absurdity and rupture, uh, interruption as a way of thinking. And you'll notice that um, one thing that artists and designers and, and scholars do, so when, I, when you hear me say scholars, you can sort of throw in there anybody who studies, you know, studies art or like art historians, writes about art like art historians, or even teachers, you know, people who teach about art, I, even though I would, even though for me, the word scholar encapsulates the maker too, you know, because when you make work, you're also producing new knowledge you're, and you're asking questions, right? So, um, but you'll usually hear me say artists, designers, scholars, right? Um, the reason I wanted to take up absurdity and rupture first is because I feel like this is perhaps the single most important artistic, creative, scholarly move that occurs in, in the 20th century or, or the 20th and the 21st century in the modern age that gets us to new knowledge or that gets us to thinking, right? So, you know, the subtext here is, or the sub, subtitle here is interruption as a way of thinking. Um, and I actually wanna start by presenting to you some very simple, uh, uh, I, I actually, in fact, may not understand it fully, but uh, there's this really great uh, proposal made by um, a phenomenologist philosopher named Martin Heidegger um, of, of this concept of the ready at hand and the present at hand. And I, I wanna, I'm gonna walk you through it a little bit because it's, it's a little tricky um, because the words sound like each other um, and because it sounds like you're doing a kind of acrobatic with your words. But at the same time, if you can understand what this means and if you can understand it practically, what it opens up for you as a creative practitioner, not just as somebody who's trying to think outside of the box, but as somebody who might be actually trying to affect change in the world is, is, um, is paradigm shifting, it's huge. So here's a tiny little picture of, of Martin Heidegger. Um, the idea of, um, present at hand and ready at hand is Martin Heidegger explains it simply through an analogy. And the analogy that he uses is the analogy of a hammer. Uh, basically what he says in his, uh, in his thinking around these two uh, ways of coming in contact with the world, whether something, then this is, he's talking specifically about objects, like about things, right? Like about, like touching a mug or you know touching a pen or holding a book in your hand right he's talking about the the felt experience right like the holding of things um but we as artists we know that things are not just solid things like ideas can also be things because they can be moved around they can be felt right uh emotions also probably count in that category um, and, uh, and things that happen in the passage of time, which is, which maybe we would call actions. Uh, all of these things have a kind of materiality to them, right? They, they have a certain kind of material. If they can be manipulated in one way or another, they have a certain kind of material. So we can actually take Martin Heidegger's idea of present at hand and ready at hand, which, which he sort of came up with in terms of objects, in terms of things, and we can we can transmit it over all of these other things that we would consider material too, right? Um, it, I may be getting too into the uh, fogginess of all of this right here, but, but I'll bring this up again at other moments so it won't feel too much like, um, you know, like I said it to you once and I'm never gonna say it to you again. So what does he say? He says, when you pick up a hammer, and I actually have a hammer here. Yes, well, I have a mallet. <laughs> so when you pick up a mallet, what happens is uh, in your use of it, the mallet becomes like an automatic extension of your arm, right? You almost don't even think about it anymore. It sort of becomes what he, it comes what, it becomes what Martin Heidegger would call ready at hand. It's something that you, it's an object that when you, hold it or when you grab it, 
it automatically becomes an extension of your body in a way. And you ignore all of its physical properties as long as it's functioning correctly, right? This, this is his example of it, right? But I think maybe a more contemporary uh, example of the same exact point would be the computer mouse. And uh, this, the reason I'm, I bring this up is because I feel like every time you sit down at a computer and we can, you can do any of these, right? A trackpad or like the surface on, the, on your phone. Um, there's a kind of intuitiveness and they're designed to be this way that when you touch the thing, the, the little cursor starts to move on the screen or your screen lights up when you touch it, or um, you know, when you use the trackpad, the cursor starts to move, things start to happen, where there's a kind of um, unconscious uh, action, intuitive action, that um, allows the thing to function without you even being conscious of the fact that you're doing it, right? That you're activating it in some way or another. It, and, and that Martin Heidegger would call present at hand, sorry, ready at hand. <laughs> See, this is, they get looped into each other, ready at hand. The thing is ready, it's ready to go. Like when you use it, it works. Now, what happens when the thing that is ready at hand has a break in it of some kind? So let's say I were to pick up this mallet here and instead of it weighing, you know, three quarters of a pound, which is what I'm estimating it weighs, let's say it only weighed a few ounces. Because my expectation is that it's got a certain kind of heft to it, I would maybe, my system, my, my, my receptors would be shocked into uh, contemplating what was happening here. Like the break, the interruption, in the expectation would create a moment of contemplation. And Martin Heidegger would call that present at hand. So that the object goes from being, when it's fully functional, when it does exactly what it's supposed to do, when it's intuitive, it's completely, um, it's ready at hand, it's ready to be used. Um, and when there's a rupture, when there's a break, when there's an interruption, when there's a lack of functionality or lack of ex expectation, all of a sudden the full materiality of that thing comes to the foreground of your sensibilities, of your consciousness, of the things that you can feel. And all of a sudden you're now thinking about it. You're thinking about the wood, you're thinking about this rubber, you're thinking about the weight of it, you're thinking about the fact that it's not working, right? And so the he's connecting this to, to the world of, uh, feeling things, objects, right? To so the phenomenological world, right? But we can actually take this idea and translate it into all of our creative practices if we start thinking about um, how it is that we perceive uh, art through our expectations. How is it that we perceive design and scholarship and learning even through our expectations? So when we come to something and it functions or works or exists in the way that we expect it to, um, perhaps we perhaps we won't give it that much attention, actually, right? And I it 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 occurs to me right now that I should have probably put into the slide presentation an image of something that I would consider. Um, pretty blase or or something that maybe we just would ignore but you can think of you can think of almost any kind of and this is not a knock on this kind of work but i'm just trying to give you an example you can think of any kind of like landscape painting or something that might decorate for example a doctor's office or you know um you know a living room or something like that it's it's again nothing wrong with those works um they have they 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 have their draw in and of themselves, but um, they're pretty much you know they're 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 ready at hand, 
they do what they're supposed to do. There, there's no additional, there's no second thought that needs to be had about those objects, about those works, about those designs, about that scholarship, right? It's, it is what it is. Um, artists, particularly in the 20th and the 21st century, have arrived at a point where they have started to make ruptures. And those ruptures, uh, well, they make ruptures in the expected. And those ruptures are what end up creating the thinking in the thing, right? And so I'll show you, I'm, I'm going to show you, today I'm just going to show you works by the American artist David Hammonds. And this is an old David Hammonds. This is from 1970. Um, but there's a lot of things happening in this picture, right? And without me even having to, without me having explained the, the, the uh, concept of ready at hand and present at hand, if I just would have shown you this image outright, automatically your body goes into that mode because there's several ruptures that are occurring here, just like without me even having to point them out, right? Um, some of them have to do with the way we understand certain symbols and the kind of relationship that we have to those symbols, right? Some of them have to do with what happens when we see a human body, which we see ourselves mirrored in, in distress or when violence occurs, right? These things all sort of, they bring, they bring the, the thing that we're looking at into the foreground. They bring it, they make it present at hand. And remember what I said, when something becomes present at hand, it becomes contemplatable. Like that's, and, con, and it's like clumsy words, right? But like contemplatable means now you can think about it. Now you're having a deeper thought, right? And so this is not, obviously this piece by David Hammonds, and I'll explain a little bit about it in a minute, um, is nothing like uh, a landscape perhaps that you would see in a doctor's office or in a waiting room or at an airport, right? And perhaps that's why an artwork like this would never get chosen to decorate uh, a place where you're not supposed to notice the work. It's supposed to decorate, but it's not supposed to stand out in any way whatsoever. Because what would happen if this was hanging in a doctor's office, um, people would start to think Right? And they would think in, in any number of directions. And since you can't predict what kinds of people are going to be coming into those spaces, uh, you want to be able to play it as safe as possible. Right? So you're going to present an artwork that reads as an artwork automatically, is non-controversial, and is you know ready at hand. It can be consumed um, harmlessly. Right? Whereas this... We could never do that with this. And this is, um, this. so the, I told you this is an early David Hammond's piece. Uh, and you'll see that he deals with some similar themes as this throughout all of his work, although the work really changes a lot. Um, this is a print that he made by, um, basically what he would do on a piece of paper is he would um, uh, cover it with, uh, he would cover himself with margarine, I think. I think that's what he was using. And then he would print his body onto the paper. And then uh, he would then sprinkle um, graphite or charcoal on the, on the paper in order to make that print emerge. Very similar to the way that maybe some of you have made drawings with glitter and glue, right? Um, except he was using his body to print um, to make those prints. And this one in particular is a print of, um, it's not of, but it's a representation of uh, Bobby Seale, who, Bobby Seals, who was um, a Black Panther leader actually in Chicago. And um, if you get a chance to, I think it's on Netflix, maybe it's on Amazon Prime, but I think there's a movie called uh, The Trial of the Chicago Seven or something like that. Um, if you get a chance to watch it, you'll maybe, or maybe you've seen it already, you'll remember that those seven men were tried um, for inciting a riot, uh, which they didn't um, by, and it was uh, the first mayor Daly, who was actually the one who was um, 
uh, leading the or pushing for them to be prosecuted in this way uh, for inciting violence during the during the, um, the Democratic Convention uh, that that is notorious for having gotten violent because Daly um, ordered the the police officers to go in there and 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 uh, and get violent with the protesters. Um, what happens in this particular moment is that he was when when David Seals was I mean Bobby Seals was in uh, in the trial um, he was uh, of course being treated unjustly um, and he uh, was speaking uh, for himself and the the judge ordered him to be uh, um, bound and gagged and and to actually sit in the courtroom um, it is maybe the most uh, in a in a movie if you watch this movie in the in a movie with some pretty horrendous scenes in it it maybe is one of the most gut-wrenching scenes of the whole film where where Bobby Seal is actually sitting there uh, while everybody else is unbound and ungagged you know going through the proceedings and being completely humiliated in this in this way so this is this is David Hammond's injustice case. Uh, again, does somebody want to say something? Again, by creating ruptures, right? By creating, by first, you know, framing this with the American flag, right? And second of all, presenting something that is visceral, that makes us uh, react with our bodies. But not only that, something that he made with his body, that David Hammond's made with his body, right? Okay. Um, this is a piece that I, I actually put these pieces, David Hammond's pieces, this is not a survey of his work, but the pieces that I'm showing you, I decided to show them to you in chronological order because one thing that I want you to see about his work is how, um, how David Hammond's lets the idea drive the medium, right? So I think one thing that we usually get taught, and again, this has to do with subject matters and it has to do with the pressure to have to choose majors and stuff like that. It, and, and also, I mean, that pressure doesn't just come from school, right? It comes from, it comes from school, but it, it's reiterated at home. And, you know, when people say, well, what are you studying, right? And you can't just say art or you can't just say design or you can't just say I'm a thinker, right? Because people want to know where the investment of education is going, what direction it's going in. But one of the things that, so the reason I'm showing you the work in chronological order is because I want you to see how David Hammonds um, is first and foremost a thinker and an artist who wants to make people think and he's doing it by uh, taking on the medium or taking on the taking on the, the materials that will work for the thing that he wants to say. And I'm not even showing you, I'm not even scratching the surface of the kinds of things that David Hammond, Hammonds has made. Um, uh, I will encourage you, I did put a video in the Compass um, site that I want you all to watch that um, shows David Hammonds' uh, most recent retrospective. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a few minutes when I show some of those pieces. Um, but if you get a chance, do a little bit of reading. There's not a ton out there because it doesn't give him a lot of interviews and he's kind of a private guy. Uh, I, I read somewhere that he, he's been described sort of as like the J.D. Salinger of, of conceptual artists or of, of contemporary artists. So there's not going to be a ton that you're going to find, but you can see a lot of pictures of his work online and you can sort of get a sense of his, his scope and the amount of things that he, he has made. So this second piece, which actually came a lot later after, so what happened with those prints was that they got very, um, they, they became a hot commodity. People really wanted them and they started uh, paying a lot of money for them. And he just wasn't into that. And so like he, he was actually disturbed by that. So he stopped making those prints um, and he, you know, what is like the, on the other side of the spectrum is to make something like this piece right here, which he later ended up calling a uh, blizzard ball sale. I made it in 1983. And what it was, was it was him standing outside of uh, 
I think it might have been Parsons in, in New York, which is an art school. Uh, he didn't go to art school there, but he he was standing outside of the the school there selling uh, various size snowballs for a dollar each. Um, and again, it wasn't advertised as an art thing. It wasn't, it was just something he did on the street. And it, it happened to be photographed by, uh, he's really good friends with the photographer Dawood Bay, who's actually from Chicago. Actually, I didn't even tell you, David Hammonds is from Springfield, Illinois. Like he was born in Springfield, Illinois, but then he moved to LA and then he moved to New York. Um, he was selling these snowballs, a dollar each, outside of the the uh, the school here. And of course, anybody who bought one of these, uh, unless they figured out a way to keep it frozen since then, you know, since 1983, doesn't own that thing anymore. Like they bought it and they don't own it anymore because what, it melted or, you know, um, there is a rumor out there that David Hammonds kept one of these and has one of these in a freezer. Um, but that has neither been confirmed by him or anybody else, right? That people like to sort of throw that myth around, but I don't know if it's actually true. Um, but you can see there's something really radical happening here too. That's another rip, right? A rip in like the ideas of how art gets sold and traded. Um, a rip of like where art should be presented, right? A tear and interruption, right? And then who's, who's, who's an artist? Right? Who gets to be and who's an art consumer? Who's a who's the audience member for that? Right. Um, another piece that uh, David Hammonds. This is maybe the piece that David Hammonds is known for the most um, is taking on the the uh, Marcus Garvey uh, Pan African flag colors and using those to make his own uh, uh, flag that is actually the American design flag. Right. And the, this piece is called African American flag, um, and all of the writing that's been done, and lots of writing. So if there, so if you want to find some writing on, actually, I think the snowball piece is maybe the most famous thing he's ever done. But the, lots of people have done a lot of writing around this particular piece. Um, so if you're interested in reading a little bit more, you might find more about this piece than you will about the, the snowball piece. Why? Because he's taking again something that we're used to something that's present at hand and he's creating an interruption he's creating a rupture in it that then makes it it turns it into a contemplation we have to think about it right and and the the most subtle gesture here is the you know taking of the word african and putting it before the 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 phrase american flag right because not only does it not only does it point to what he did here by taking the Pan-African flag colors and superimposing them with the American flag, but he's also pointing to the fact that the American flag, meaning the red, white, and blue one, and the one that's just called the American flag that doesn't have any qualifiers, any, any descriptor terms before the word American um, is someone else's flag, right? It's almost like, who does the American flag belong to? It belongs to, uh, a, a, a white supremacist country, and then the African American flag is maybe the flag that African American that belongs to African Americans. It also separates. It separates. Um, it. I shouldn't say it separates. It creates a bracket for the for the um, segregationist culture that we live in 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 this country. Um, so it sort of like points at it, right? By creating this uh, rupture into something that is a symbol that we all, and and the, here's the other thing, the rupture could be in fact, um, the rupture goes in, in multiple directions. One part of it is where I, we're seeing something that we hadn't seen before, but the other part might be that we're now feeling things Right? And those things could have to do with our associations with the original symbol, the thing that we're used to seeing, the thing that maybe we don't even blink at. Like we don't blink at the fact that <clears throat> the American flag gets plastered on uh, all sorts of things. Um, here's another one that don't don't be startled by here. I I I 
I, I want to, um, it's, it, there's, there's, there's something very interesting that's happening with this particular piece that he made. Um, so I probably should have told you a little while ago, but one of the major influences for David Hammonds is Marcel Duchamp. And maybe you don't know who Marcel Duchamp is, but this is a person probably who you studied in one of your art classes. And the piece that they probably showed you was this piece right here on the right-hand side, right? So this is Marcel Duchamp's Fountain, uh, which some art historians, many artists and many art critics might argue is the single most important artwork that was made in the 20th century. Now, I wanna pause you right away because right, you know, some of you, your, your stomach might already be like coming, you know, like turning into a knot here, right? Because you might have some really strong opinions about this because you've probably been in a class where you've had a really intense discussion about this. And first of all, about whether it's art, whether it's good art, et cetera, et cetera, right? And now there's even a discussion about whether or not Marcel Duchamp was the one who actually made this, right? Which it's too much of a tangent to get into that aspect of it, but what all you really need to know for, for this conversation is that whether Marcel Duchamp conceptualized this piece or not, he was the, he leveraged it. Like he turned it into the thing that 20th and 21st century artists grabbed onto to say, we can make, this is giving us a permission to behave a certain way as artists. And what was the permission? The permission was that you didn't have to ha have your hand in the work, like that the work could be an idea driven work first and foremost, that it didn't have to be handcrafted necessarily, or that the artists themselves didn't have to make it at all, right? And if you don't know anything about this piece, the, the summary that I could give you is that, without telling you the whole story, Marcel Duchamp essentially took a, a men's urinal and uh, submitted that as a, as a sculpture to, to an art show. He, he signed it with a pseudonym and then he, he submitted it as a sculpture to an art show. And the reason that it has had this ripple effect throughout the 20th and 21st century, again, is because it, it, it sort of obliterated that idea that the artist was this uh, heavenly inspired genius that uh, made things um, with their skills, their art specific genius skills, right? Uh, Marcel Duchamp was basically saying, no, I, I can actually have a thought and the thought is that this porcelain urinal is like a fountain. And maybe it's even a prank, right? But maybe it's serious. And I can order this thing, pay for it, sign it, and then that's the work, right? So again, I want to encourage you to suspend your taste about this. It's, this isn't about whether you like it or you don't like it. I'm trying to get you to understand what the idea is here. The idea was that this sort of floodgate was open about what was possible in terms of making, right? In terms of uh, I, the, the intersection of making and ideas. And David Hammonds would consider himself, David Hammonds would consider himself uh, a descendant of this way of working, right? So that, that's why you see, for example, uh, well, those with that, with that urinal and all the other objects that Marcel Duchamp did that to, would be called is a ready-made, right? Which is an interesting interplay. And it has an inter interesting interplay with uh, Martin Heidegger's ready at hand, right? But this idea that this thing itself is the artwork. So because David Hammonds was so like, is so attached to Marcel Duchamp's idea and this idea of taking something that's in the world and turning that into the artwork or taking something and just reappropriating and putting it into the world and creating the rupture of expectation in that way, he made this piece, which uh, is, is identified as an artist book. And basically what it is, it's, it's a Bible. Well, I should say it's the cover of a Bible, but with a book about Marcel Duchamp um, uh, in that's what the pages are. So it's not like when you're flipping through, it's not an actual Bible. It's a book about Marcel Duchamp uh, with the cover of a Bible on it, right? Um, and of course, what, I mean, I can let you derive your own meanings from what David Hammonds is trying to point out here. But if I had to help you a little bit, I would just say, you know, uh, it's almost like that expression that people use, like, oh, that's my Bible, right? Like, they're, they're trying to say, like, that's the book I live by, 
that's my sacred text, right? That's the thing that uh, influences me, guides me, right? And he's, he's this is sort of like an homage or he's paying this tribute to Marcel Duchamp. But curiously enough, and you'll notice here, he calls this, um, he, you know, it says a Holy Bible there, but then right here on the side, it also says Old Testament, right? So he's, he's actually pointing to the fact maybe that the second text had the new testament hasn't been written yet that maybe he's writing it that maybe his work uh is the second volume right running a little bit out of time i i put a, a clip in the compass um on the on the compass page and what this clip is it's um it's a, a video a youtuber who lives in los angeles and he goes to different art shows and just with his phone, he just videotapes the exhibitions. And he made a video of David Hammonds' uh, retrospective at a gallery called Hauser and Worth in Los Angeles. The reason that this is special is because David Hammonds, in the same way that he resisted the market when he stopped making those prints, he actually is not really into working with museums and lots of museums, because he's such an important artist of the 20th century that lots of museums have approached him about making a retrospective. A retrospective is just an exhibition where you show your, you know, your entire portfolio of works, everything you've done in your entire career. Um, he's just resisted that. He's been given that offer hundreds of times by different museums all over the world, but he doesn't want to work with museums. And so when this gallery what this gallery told him was that he had free reign. He could just do whatever he wanted uh, and they weren't going to restrict them. Then he took them up on it and he, uh, and he did, he did this uh, retrospective at Hauser and Worth. Um, I'm only showing you these so that when you're watching that video, you have a little bit of context because you're going to see some of these like this, this is um, a series of paintings that he made where the paintings underneath are these sort of like high art abstract paintings but then they're covered with tarps, garbage bags. Uh, and so the only way that people can actually see them is like trying to peek through the holes of the works. Um, another set of paintings that he made were made with Kool-Aid and they're just like watercolor paintings, but they're all made with Kool-Aid. Um, and then this piece is the, maybe the piece that is gonna stand out the most of the one that I wanted to point out. So he made this installation in the courtyard of the gallery um, where there are all these tents, like hundreds of tents, and they all have this phrase, this could be you, stenciled, like spray paid stenciled on them. And um, he made this sort of in response, he used to live in Los Angeles, and Hauser and Worth is actually very close to Skid Row, which is a part where, of Los Angeles where um, so many homeless people live. And so he sort of created this kind of um, sculpture that's like a, a uh, uh, the same, it echoes the same architecture that's happening in Skid Row, which is these sort of makeshift homes. Um, and, but he wanted to put them inside of the gallery. And part of it, part of the reason that he was doing that is because a lot of the work that David Hammonds uh, makes has to do with this tension between privilege and and, and not having privilege, right? Like being inside or outside. That's, you know, you can see that actually in uh, this these paintings, right? Where you have like these sort of high-end paintings covered by these tarps and these bags. And then here in particular, um, there's this great juxtaposition of these tents, which are the David Hammonds installation with this neon sign, which is not actually a David Hammonds piece. It's a piece by a British artist named Martin Creed. Um, and I can show you, this is the Martin Creed installation in England. Um, and this is the one that's at Hauser and Worth. But it's sort of like, uh, as I read one art critic talking about it, he was saying that the, the sculpture, David Hammond's sculpture in a way, cancels out the sort of triteness or the the, vag the vagaries of this, everything is going to be all right statement by, by Martin Crete, which, you know, some people might read as like fun or, you know, lighthearted or, or optimistic or whatever. Um, but then there's this, there's this sort of like jamming or interruption of the, of the optimism of that phrase. 
And for what it's worth, Martin Creed is this kind of like jokester artist who who makes that kind of work. Um, and you know, uh, he's he's white. He's a white British artist. Um, and and uh, David Hammond's sort of like juts this thing up against it again to create an inter interruption to create a tear. Um, so it's 12.47, I, I'm going to actually stop here. Uh, what I want to do is I want, so there's a lot of things here, right? There's the concept of ready at hand and present at hand, and how does that happen in art, right? Um, and then there is this one example of one artist who did it in a bunch of different ways, and I sort of zipped through his portfolio, um, like jumping from one decade to another, but there's so much other interesting work in between all of that where he was just like a thinker making work that makes you think by creating interruptions, right? Um, so the question that we're gonna have for this week in the discussion is gonna, I'm, and I'm gonna forward it to your uh, uh, teaching team and they're gonna put it up and then you'll be able to respond to it. But it's around this idea of interruption. Like I'm gonna be asking you to reflect on works, your works or the works that you've seen that created these kinds of interruptions that then sort of led you to a moment of thinking. And this will just kind of get us on the, on the path here to start to think about how our work ourself is, is not supposed to be neutral. It's, it's supposed to create some kind of um, ripple in the world, right? Um, because otherwise we're just, we may potentially just be making more garbage. Um, and we, I think we need to be careful about that. So. I appreciate you hanging out on Friday and uh, I will see you next week. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Have a good week. Thank you. 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 Thank you.